Okay, uh, good morning and welcome to the 10th meeting in 2015 of the Health and Sport Committee. I have apologies from our convener, Duncan McNeil and Mike McKenzie, and can I welcome the SNP substitute, Graham Day, with us this morning, becoming a familiar face at committee. I would ask everyone in the room to switch off mobile phones as they can interfere with the sound system. You will see some of us using tablet devices. This is instead of hard copies of our papers. Our first item on the agenda today is a decision on taking business in private, and I invite committee members to agree to take item four in private. Item four is your approach to the Carer Scotland Bill, and we normally discuss such matters in private. Is the committee agreed? agreed. Okay, the committee is agreed. Thank you uh, to members for that. We now move to agenda item two, subordinate legislation, and we have six negative instruments before us today. The first instrument is Public Bodies Joint Working Integration Joint Boards and Integration Joint Monitoring Committees, Amendment Scotland Order 2015, SSI 2015-66. There has been no motion to annul, and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has, made, has not made any comments on the instrument. Can I invite any comments from members? Okay, there being no comments from members, can I ask if the committee has agreed to make no recommendations? Okay, that's agreed. Thank you. The second instrument is the Public Bodies Joint Working Integration Joint Board Establishment Scotland Order 2015 SSI 2015 forward slash 88. Again, there has been no motion to annul and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has not made any comments on the instrument. Can I invite any comments from members here this morning? Okay, there being... No comments from members. Can I ask if the committee has agreed to make no recommendations? Okay, that is agreed. Thank you. The third instrument this time is Personal Injuries NHS Charges Amount Scotland Amendment Regulations 2015 SSI 2015 forward slash 81. Again, there has been no motion to annul and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has, made no, has not made any comments on the instrument. Uh, in this instance, can I invite any comments from members? Okay, there being no comments from members, can I ask once more if the committee has agreed to make no recommendations? Agreed. Agreed. Okay, that is agreed. Thank you. The fourth instrument is National Health Service Optical Charges and Payment Scotland Amendment <coughs> Regulations 2015 SSI 2015 forward slash 86. Once again, there has been no motion to annul, and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has not made any comments on the instrument. In this instance, do members have any comments to make? Okay, there have been no comments uh, made. Is the committee agreed to make no recommendations? Okay, that is agreed. Thank you. Nearly there. The fifth instrument is the National Health Service Cross Border Healthcare Scotland Amendment Regulations 2015. SSI 2015 forward slash 91. There has been no motion to annul and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has not made any comments on the in instrument. In this instance, do members have any comments to make? Okay, there have been no comments from members. Can I ask once again if the committee has agreed not to make any recommendations? Okay, thank you for that. That is agreed. The final instrument before us this morning, the sixth instrument, is the Professional Standards Authority for Health and Social Care Fees Regulations 2015, SSI 2015, uh, forward slash 400. Again, there's been no motion to nil, and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has not made any comments on the instrument. Can I invite comments from members? Yes. Dr Simpson. Um, this, in effect, passes the cost of running the Professional Standards Authority for Health and Social Care, or it used to be just health, um, to the bodies which it is supervising. They, in turn, of course, will pass the fee on to the individual members who are registered. Um, so I inquired as to what this would be, and apparently it is only in the region of £3 per member, which is not a lot. But on the other hand, if you're a nurse or a midwife and have just had a 50% increase in the fee that you pay to the Nursing and Midwifery Council, then this could be a, another straw on a camel's back. Uh, I don't think that's maybe the right expression, but nevertheless, I think it should be recognised, and I want to put on the record, that the nurses and midwives have already sustained a very substantial increase in their fees at a time when their wages were initially frozen and then increased by a sub-inflation level until this year. So uh, the fact that the, this, is, this is a small but nevertheless a further increase in fee is one which I have to say I regret. 
uh, as um, occurring at this point in time. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Dr Simpson, do any other members have any comments to make on this particular instrument? Okay, well, those comments are now on, on the record, Dr Simpson. So that said, has the committee agreed not to make any recommendations in this instance? Okay, that is agreed. And thank you. Um, okay, we now move to agenda item three, which is in relation to fertility treatment. Uh, that's our main business for the day. And we are going to hear from some of the patient organisations and next week we'll hear from a selection of NHS boards. So uh, thank you for waiting patiently. Can I welcome to the meeting uh, Su Susan Sheenan, co-chair of Fertility Fairness, chief executive in Fertility Network UK and Sylvia Shearer, chair of the board of trustees in, in Fertility Network Scotland. Um, you're welcome this morning. Thank you for coming along. Okay, now as previously agreed, we're going to move straight to questions if, if, if you're content with that. And can I have an opening question from Dennis Robertson, please? Uh, thank you very much, convener, and good morning. Um, with regard to the submissions, um, <clears throat> I wonder if you're able to expand slightly. Um, when we're looking at the fertility, uh, there wasn't much mention of the, uh, the causes in terms of male infertility. Um, what percentage of of the, the the problems is due to male infertility in terms of low sperm count? In general, um, yeah. we tend to work with the figure that around a third of fertility problems are male factor issues, around a third are female issues, and around a third are joint factor problems where there's an identified cause. Um, so. Okay. That's the, the general clinical um, basis when they're, they're assessing the, the number of um, patients with, with various different issues. What stage in the process uh, in terms of, because I was looking at the process in terms of the, the initial one, you know, the patient will see their GP and discuss uh, uh, obviously the, the, the problems of not uh, getting pregnant and obviously the GP would look at um, We've looked at sort of things like body mass or, or whether or not the, the person's got appropriate diets or that sort of thing. At what stage do we actually look at the, the male fertility? Is it at that point that we uh, find out about the sperm count or is it a second phase when uh, they've been recommended? Uh, I mean, obviously the recommendation initially for the woman was to go to see a gynaecologist. Um, but at what stage do we look at the male? The male should be looked at very early on as well because there is no point in putting a female partner through a whole range of yeah. tests um, and not checking out the male partner. And I think that's fairly well laid out in the pathway, which was put forward by the National Infertility Group. I don't have that with me at the moment, yeah. but um, we can certainly send a copy of that to you if you want. Um, but it sh the male partner should be looked at very, very, on, very early on um, in the whole process to make sure that there is or isn't a sperm count issue or a motility issue. Okay. Uh, uh, do you welcome the, the progress that has been made in uh, obviously reducing the time factor? Because in some areas it was very, very great in some areas in terms of the waiting times. Do you welcome the reduction? Um, that we've we've now met the the twelve month period uh, across the health boards. Yes, very much so. Um, the the reason we've now met um, and actually are down below twelve months across all health boards in Scotland now um, is thanks to the support and the investment by the Scottish government in fertility services. It was very very inequitable, with some patients waiting three to six months and some patients waiting around about four years. Um, there were other inequities as well, but the waiting times was um, a huge issue for patients and the government's support and investment has made a massive difference and every health board in Scotland is now down below 12 months, which is really good news. Yeah, that, that, that's good. Um, in terms of, uh, just maybe a couple more questions, can we know? Um, can, I, can I just yeah, someone yeah. Yeah. Sylvia, by apology, would you want to make a comment in relation no, to that no, as well? I'm just listening to what Susan's saying and okay. I'm, uh, endorsing it entirely with regard to the, the work that's been done uh, under the national group uh, and the Scottish Government. It's, it's made a tremendous difference, reducing mm. it to 
I, I mean, it's fairly obvious if you've waited a long time to have a, a child and you're not becoming pregnant, time is passing. Yeah. The criteria, there's there's a cut-off point, and the longer you have, you're on a waiting list to be seen or, or to be given treatment, you know, the time factor is essential in that. I can just add that um, the older, particularly the female partner, the older she is, the um, yeah. more likely she is to have fertility problems, but also the success rates tend to go down as you get older. So it's really important yeah. that people are seen and diagnosed and treated <coughs> quickly, and then the treatment is much more effective. Yeah. With regard to the treatment in terms of the first cycle, second cycle, and sometimes on to the third, what is the waiting time between each treatment, generally speaking? Um, patients should be allowed to undertake a second cycle when they are ready, um, but it's clinically accepted that there should be a period of a few months just for the woman's body to get back to normal. And I think the group recommendation was around about six months okay. um, before you would then undertake a second cycle. So, I mean, basically the, the, the second cycle could maybe be up to six months and then I take it if they will move on to a third cycle, it could be the same type of period? It could be. Um, some couples might prefer to wait a bit longer. Um, some couples might, might feel that they're just not emotionally ready. Some might feel they're not quite physically ready to undergo a second cycle within a few months. Okay. And, and um, that brings me on very nicely to um, the fact that I, I didn't note within the uh, submissions we had any, any areas where maybe counselling is available um, to the couple or to the couples uh, maybe after a second cycle's failed. It, would you recommend counselling or Absolutely. does it happen? Um, all couples should have access to counselling um, right the way through the whole fertility treatment. Um, however, there is an issue with access to counselling at the moment. Um, counsellors in the NHS are in very short supply and whilst we have some very, very good counsellors, there can be a long waiting list. If, you, if you've had a failed cycle and you really need to speak to a counsellor, you don't want to wait six or eight weeks for an appointment. Um, and that's an issue which <coughs> has been recognised um, and which we would love to see um, more investment in counselling. OK. And finally, if I may, convener, um, I didn't note anything about AID, the artificial insemination by donor within the submissions. It, in certain cases, if uh, a couple, for instance, one person may have a hereditary condition that they feel that they, they wouldn't want to pass on um, a, to a child, um, they quite often look at a, a, a donor. How common is that? Um, I think that's possibly a question best addressed to a clinician, but I'll try to answer it as best I can. Um, there are two options if you don't want to pass a genetic condition onto a child. You can have what's called pre-genetic diagnosis, yeah. where your embryos can be screened to make sure that the embryos you're using are not carrying the genetic condition, or you can actually move on to donor treatment. Um, that would be a decision between the clinician and the couple concerned as to which route would be best for them in their own individual circumstances. Um, mm -hmm. And if donor treatment was the right option for the couple, then donor treatment would be the route that they would move would move towards, mm -hmm. assuming there were donors. We're not aware of the, the, the sort of numbers in that area, are we? The numbers of people accessing donor treatment? Yeah. Um, I don't have the figures in my head, but I can certainly get them for you. It would be interesting, I think. So you're looking for the number of people who access donor treatment as opposed to using and their own... And the reasons own, why, yeah. yeah. Donor sperm, donor yeah. eggs, or both? Um, I think the sperm, but I mean, if they're donor eggs as well, in terms of that, um, that would be interesting. And just but on I, the NHS. But I would, have thought that the, 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 I would have thought that maybe the main area is probably donor via sperm, I would have thought. But, I mean, that's just my thinking. Um, in, it'd be good to know. In general, and this is an overall UK figure, the number of people accessing donor treatment is about 14% of the number of people accessing fertility treatment in general. That would be donor treatment of any kind, but that's private as well as um, yes, NHS that. treatment, and that's across the whole of the UK. That's fine. Uh, thank you, convener. Okay. Now, um, uh, Dr. Simpson, I'll let you in in a second, but uh, we're calling Annette Mullins asked for a supplementary in, in, in the cycle part of Dennis's question. Yeah, thanks, convener. It was, it was just to... You, understand exactly what 
is a cycle, is that the whole cycle from harvesting of, of you know, from the embryos um, to implantation, or can, does it all, a new cycle also constitute the implantation of frozen embryos? Um, a full cycle of treatment should be the stimulation um, of the ovaries to produce the eggs, the harvesting of the eggs, the fertilisation, hopefully, um, of those eggs into embryos, the replacement of normally one of those embryos as a fresh transfer, and then the freezing and subsequent replacement of any viable frozen embryos thereafter. That would be what would be constituted as a full cycle. cycle. Thank you. That's helpful. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sutton. Okay. Can I just be clear on that? So that the second a second cycle would start from the very beginning again? Yes. No, it yes. would. A second cycle would start from the beginning once all the frozen embryos had been replaced. You, utilized. You would, so you, 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 you can have repeated implantation as part of your first cycle? Yes. Everybody's cycle is different. Um, in general, a couple may, for instance, um, yield eight to ten eggs. Maybe six of those may fertilise, sometimes more, sometimes less. Um, if they were all viable, um, then in a normal cycle you would perhaps replace one because a single embryo yes. transfer is the norm. Freeze any that are left and they may not all thaw successfully. So you could end up with one or two frozen embryo transfers as part of your first full cycle. After that, you would start at the beginning again and be stimulated to produce more eggs and the whole cycle would start again and that would be the start of a second cycle. Okay, that's, that's actually very interesting, helpful clarification. Um, Convener, I actually sat on the Infertility Commission in the 80s and I think it's disappointing to hear that they, I was there as the GP psychiatrist, I have to say, not as the expert in infertility. And in those days, I, can't, I don't think we had a patient representative which shows how things at least have progressed a little bit in our thinking since then. But my, my role on that commission was actually saying two, two or three things. One was that, that every person, every couple going through the process needed a, na a named individual that was their support. Because my experience as a GP and a psychiatrist was treating people who got quite depressed with the whole process because it was prolonged um, and there were all sorts of issues around it. So I'm really disappointed to hear about the counselling and I'd like to know, and this is my first question, about the, the named, uh, named person. Is there a named person when you start the process? Overall, no. Um, Infertility Network Scotland, as the patient organisation, tries to provide as much support as possible. Um, and we have staff, um, again thanks to the support of the government, we have staff working, dedicated staff working in Scotland, which um, patients can access at any time. We set up support groups across the whole of Scotland. I think we have about 10 or 11 support groups at the moment running. Um, so we try to ensure that there is always some point of contact, whether it's from our staff or whether it's from our volunteers, um, where people, if they have questions, can talk to someone. We also, as a national charity, have a support line, which is run by a trained fertility nurse, a former fertility nurse who has counselling experience. Um, we have a range of helpliners who have been trained in basic counselling and listening skills, so we do offer that service as well. Um, but we have to try to make sure that patients know that that service is there, and we do that to the best of our ability. In terms of a named person in the clinic, I think the clinics in Scotland are are, are fairly good at supporting patients. Um, the staff are very very supportive and very helpful. I think the the stumbling block is perhaps access to a proper counselling session. So I think the patients in Scotland do know that there are people they can talk to. Um, it's perhaps when they want to access a trained counsellor that they sometimes face a wait, um, which is unacceptable, I think. That's interesting. Maybe we'll look at that um, in future. On the, on the question of the cycles, which uh, Dennis Robertson raised, uh, pay tribute to our late colleague Helen Eady who campaigned very strongly on the um, question of the postcode lottery that previously existed so it's very welcome to hear that that has, has stopped but is there still a problem in relation to age because the, as I understand it there's a difference between England and Scotland in terms of the age at which your ability to access IVF actually changes um, The recommendations are the same in that patients under where the woman is aged under 40 um, 
can access a different number of cycles from where the woman is aged 40 to 42. So over the age of 40, the recommendation is for them to access one cycle. Under the age of 40, the recommendation made by the national group was for the couple um, to access three cycles. However, in the interim, um, until they had equity and reduced the waiting times, the decision was made to offer two and look at reviewing the number of cycles as well as the question of um, existing children early in 2015, which is what the national group is doing now. So the recommendation is basically the same in Scotland as it is in England. So hopefully we'll now go for three if... if I can't see any reason why we wouldn't want to move forward to three. And would that move up to patients. two for those over 40? Or no, would it, stay no at one? it would stay at one cycle. Okay. Right. It's, 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 sorry, Sylvie. It's, it's not for every woman aged 40 to 42. There's tighter criteria. Um, and it's where the woman has not previously accessed fertility treatment in the past um, and does not have a low ovarian reserve. Because some women over the age of 40 who have a low ovarian reserve, their chances of success would be much lower. Oh. Um, so they, would, they look very carefully at whether it would, in fact, be cost as well as clinically effective to offer them um, a cycle. Okay. And my last question is, again, something that was on, on the Commission in the 80s. And one of the things that we noted then was the uh, rather bad habit of repeated tests. So you often went to a non-specialist unit for your diagnosis of infertility. But then when you moved into the IVF programme, you went to a specialist clinic. I presume that's still the same. But have we eliminated the repeating of tests, but, you know, which was distressful for the, stressful for the patients or the couple? Uh, and, and also costly to the NHS. Uh, and that was one of the things we recommended should be eliminated. Yeah, I think we've, we've, moved, we've moved a lot further forward with that. Um, mm. The national group, when they made the recommendations, produced a, a patient pathway as well, which should be followed from GP all the way through. Um, and hopefully that has made a massive difference to eliminating, eliminating the duplicate tests. Thank you very much. OK, thanks, Richard. I'm going to, in a moment, allow Graham in for a, for a supplementary, and I've got, I've got Rhoda on the list as well, but uh, just a small supplementary myself in relation to, there was some discussion around counselling and the need to expand that, but uh, and, and I think we, we, we all listened quite carefully to what you said there, and we've got the NHS next week to, and we'll, we'll ask them in relation to that. But you also said something about uh, the environment that uh, um, couples go to in the NHS when, when, when they start uh, infertility treatment, is it by and large a welcoming environment and a supportive environment for the individuals and couples who, who seek infertility treatment? Because I think, yes, counselling is very important, but the culture and environment has to be kind of, the ethos has to be right to support a uh, couple. So have we got that right? I think, I think there's always room for improvement, but in general, I would say that most patients are fairly happy and feel reasonably well supported in Scotland in the um, NHS clinics. <clears throat> Excuse me, we did have a, a patient comment that uh, when she, she went to for her treatment uh, there were big signs about the infertility clinic and she didn't feel she was as yet infertile and that might be something that uh, boards mm. wish to consider. Yeah. Would they be right in saying uh, the terminology is supposed to be assisted conception rather than in, in fertility? In general, clinics are moving towards names like the assisted conception unit um, or something with a more positive name around about fertility. Um, this particular patient um, had gone to mm. one clinic which was labelled as the infertility clinic. Um, okay. And I think that's a very good point that Sylvia's made. That's something that um, we only had the comment um, just over a week ago and it's something that we're we would like to take forward with the clinic and see if there's there's anything which can be done. But I think, yes, um, looking at it from a positive perspective, patients want to feel that they're moving forward in a positive way, not be labelled as infertile. And that's a big mm. culture shift over the last mm. few years um, across the whole of the UK. OK, that, that's helpful. Thank you for putting that on the record. Graham, you wanted in? I, I did indeed. Thank you, Convener. Just a point of information. In the Infertility Network submission, it says that the situation at the end of December 2012 it was around 20% of eligible patients could potentially access three cycles of treatment, 80% two. What's the up-to-date position? Well, everybody accesses two, two. now. Two. There's nowhere where people can access three at the moment at all? Not in the NHS. Right. The, okay. um, the National Group made the recommendation for three cycles, but in the interests of equity and bringing the waiting times down, it was agreed to move to two, two. in the initial stages um, with a recommendation that it be reviewed 
now, basically, okay, that thank everybody you. accesses. Just want to be clear on that. Again, Rhoda, please, uh, my forbearance here, because specifically in relation to that. All right, well, I'll let you in before myself then, Rhoda. Okay, okay. Um, because before the review, a number of clinics had offered three cycles on the NHS, and that dropped down to two. I mean, it did. That, that seems, I mean, why? And has that had an impact on people? Yes, there were some health boards which were offering three cycles. Um, at the time we did a survey, there were uh, nine health boards offering three cycles, um, although some of them were smaller health boards, not, not the bigger ones. So, um, Which it, ones do you know off the top of your head? Um, I can tell you um, which ones were offering three. Um, The ones that it's were. in the submission. Sorry, I missed it. Uh, yes, okay, so we got it there. Your yeah. Sherrard um, and Grampian and the Highland. Yeah, some of the side. and some of the smaller ones. What happened was a lot of them were offering three cycles. Nine were offering three, but actually, by the time the national group started, either two or three of the ones who had been offering three had already dropped to two, and that's why it was only about twenty percent of patients in Scotland who were able to offer. Um, were actually able to access the three. But yes, some patients were able to access three and have been slightly disadvantaged. Um, the reason behind that was to try to get equity across the whole of Scotland, and the hope was that ultimately we would move to the three cycles and everybody would then be able to access three. If, it, if I could come in here, um, we seem, I'm not directly involved, but it seems to be from what I can gather from colleagues, there's a, an element of resistance to moving to three, despite the fact that we have now achieved equity and everybody getting treatment within the 12 months. And we don't really understand why that should be. They should be saying, now we've achieved that, we move to three, and we don't know why they're not doing it. Who, who, is, who, is, who is putting forward the resistance? Are you aware of who and... It's a general, um, just a general feeling from the uh, members of the National Infertility Group. You know, as the patient organisation and my colleagues who represent um, patients on the group are very, very strongly um, behind the need to move very quickly to three cycles. And we're just feeling that it's not happening as quickly as we, we, we can't see why it they wouldn't just automatically move to three, given that that was the recommendation of the group. The group recommended three cycles um, and said that once the waiting times were down to below 12 months, at the latest early 2015, they would consider moving to three cycles um, and reviewing the criteria around existing children. Um, and that's what they're doing now, but it's, it just doesn't seem to be happening as fast as we would, we would like it to. Um, we, we just think now is the time that the waiting times are down that it's a no-brainer, we should just move straight to, to offering everybody who's eligible three cycles. That doesn't mean everybody would get three cycles. Mm -hmm. It would only be those patients who are eligible um, and for whom the clinician felt it would be clinically effective to offer the third cycle. Right. And that's an important point. We wouldn't be saying you have an automatic right to a third mm -hmm. cycle. It's a clinical decision. Uh, however, the option should be presented, we, we feel. Is there capacity in the system that would allow that to happen? Yes, yes. yes there's no capacity issue. Um, there was um, an issue in, with um, capacity at Glasgow for a short time, um, but their new unit has been opened um, and they have no capacity problem at all. So as far as we're aware, there's no capacity problem. Okay, thank you. Okay, now in a moment I'll take you in, and Dennis, I'd add a supplementary and similar line of question that, that, that Rhoda had. Um, I think um, the first thing I would ask in relation to the boards who were previously offering three cycles, um, were were they were there any capacity issues in terms of what I'm thinking about when someone or a couple starts their first cycle um, and then they have the ability, well, hopefully they don't need three cycles, but very likely they might need three cycles. Um, does that stop a new person presenting coming in to get their first cycle? So by reducing to two cycles in those health boards, and I make no judgment whether that's the right thing or the wrong thing to do, but by moving to two cycles, did new couples who presented themselves, did they get quicker access to uh, IVF or uh, assisted conception? Uh, 
I think that's difficult to quantify because at the time that they reduced um, some health boards from three to two cycles, the government invested £12 million into bringing the waiting times down. Um, so that massively brought the waiting times down, but that happened at the same time. Um, I guess if you were offering couples an additional cycle, then technically there, there would be some impact on couples coming onto the list. Um, but I, I couldn't say how much that would be okay. at the moment. And it's hard to quantify because of the investment um, made at the same time. Okay, and the, the, the second supplementary I had was in relation to whether there's flexibility in the two cycle system. So for example, if um, a couple uh, go through their first cycle and for whatever reason you can't have a, a fresh transfer there and then and the embryos have to be frozen, that wouldn't then trigger something to say, well actually because the chances of uh, a frozen embryo making it through to, 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 to having your child is, is less than a, a fresh embryo transfer, that wouldn't trigger something. Is, are there any, what I'm trying to tease out is, are there any flexibilities in the system as things currently stand in relation to two cycles? No, basically you're, you're allowed access to up to two cycles if it's clinically effective. If you don't have a okay. fresh transfer, your embryos would be frozen, um, transferred as part of a fresh cycle. But actually there's a lot of evidence now that frozen embryo transfers are as good Okay. Um, now as fresh transfers. Um, there's a new study this year starting mm -hmm. considering actually whether everyone should have frozen embryo transfers and not have any fresh transfers okay. um, and that's going to be starting this year. That's, I, it shows, shows how how a lot of the data there's conflicting evidence in relation to, to, to what is best. My, my, I, I apologise to my committee mem fellow committee members but I just a final supplementary in relation to whether there's a need for flexibility currently in relation to two cycles would be, of course, uh, one, one lady may get um, six or seven eggs and another may get 12 or 13, but that may be in relation to clinical decisions around uh, the protocol that, yeah. the, that the couple goes under and the type of stimulation that, that has done to avoid hyperstimulation. And it's not, the whole thing's not an exact science. So it's not. Um, I'm just wondering whether you feel there is the need without taking that judgment call whether we should just go now to three cycles or not, whether as things currently stand, you feel there is a need for flexibility around the, the, the two cycles? I'm not quite sure how we could be flexible around it. Um, I think, you know, and this possibly highlights again how important it is to have a third cycle because quite often the first cycle is almost what the clinicians call a diagnostic cycle. They don't always get it right first time. Um, they tweak the protocol, change the protocol for the second cycle, and sometimes it takes them to the third <coughs> cycle to actually get it right. I'm not sure how, how flexibility within the two cycles could actually make a difference um, to, how, to what they offer, because if you, if you, if you give um, a couple one particular protocol and they're not responding, um, they will change that during the cycle if they can. Um, so it's always a moving target sometimes with couples if the woman's not responding. Okay, I think that was very helpful to put on the record in relation to that first cycle, almost been diagnostic in terms of how 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 the the mum responds, uh, the woman responds. I got two supplementaries also in relation to that. Dennis was first, and then Richard Lyle. Uh, thank you very much, convener. It, it's maybe just language, Susan, but um, <clears throat> I think you stated that y y you felt that nobody was offering the, the, the sort of three cycles. Are we sure that, are, are you are you saying that no hospital or no health board is currently doing it? Uh, you know, is that fact or is it, is someone, or some of the health boards moving to it that you're not aware of? I'm not aware of anybody who's not following the current guidance, okay. um, which is to offer two cycles. Yeah. But it's, there is the potential there that uh, a, uh, a health board may be moving from the two to the three that you're not aware of? There may be. There may be. There may be. I'm certainly not aware of anyone that's offering three cycles at the moment. Um, as far as we're aware, everyone is following the standard access criteria and the, the two cycles. <coughs> okay, that, that's useful. Thank you. And there's nothing to prevent health boards offering a third cycle if they so chose to? 
it's not against the rules is what I mean. There's national guidelines to offer two cycles, but if a health board wanted to move to three, there's nothing in statute to stop them doing that. Well, I think that given that the two cycles has been um, adopted um, and funded by the government in terms of offering equity, then I think there would be a perceived, rightly perceived unfairness Okay. Again, if some health boards were offering something different. Um, so I think there would be a lot of people would have something to say okay. if um, some people were being offered a third cycle because the, the whole ethos behind this was to move to an equitable and fair system across the whole of Scotland where there was no postcode lottery um, and treatment did not depend on which health board you came under. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 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 reasons primarily moving from a second to third cycle anyway. It's a clinical decision. Um, well, at the moment, there's no recommendation right. for the third cycle. If um, and when we move to three cycles being the adopted recommendations, then it will, as always, be a clinical decision as to whether you have either a first, a second or a third cycle. Yeah because it would always be dependent on whether the clinician felt it was in the best interests and the most cost and clinically effective way to move forward with the couple. OK, thank Jesus. you. Um, Richard Lyle. Uh, thank you, Kenya. Can I first of all say, and I may, I may not get the chance to say it later, I, I welcome this debate as anything we can do to uh, ensure that couples can have a baby. Uh, many of us know uh, what uh, trauma can be, you know, people trying to, to, to have children and and can't or, or uh, get to a situation where um, you know they, they are trying everything to have a baby, and I, I welcome this. But basically, in your uh, in your submission, can, can we get onto the fact of the three, three cycles? You say in your own submission, uh, not to lose sight of a very invasive procedure required during fertility treatment, and that couples would not undertake a third cycle lightly. And also, you're going to say that there's a cogent argument made by the clinicians that not all women would benefit from a, th a third cycle. But many patients will not, and this is in your submission, many patients will not require a, a third cycle, but you feel strongly that those who benefit from three cycles should have that option. How many people actually physically um, go for uh, infertility treatment? Uh, and how many actually, uh, at the end of the day, only require a third cycle? Do we have that data? I think that's data that um, ISD are looking at at the moment, so I, I'm afraid I don't have that just now, but I think that's a piece of work that the National Infertility Group are doing with um, colleagues in ISD to so look at that information. W would I be right in suggesting that maybe 20% or 20, you, you, you're on, uh, or 25% of, of people go for a third cycle, or, or you know, are, are, are these, is that too I'm, low or too I'm not, high? I'm not quite sure where we're going with this. There's a difference between couples who opt for a third cycle because they would be paying privately at the moment for one, yes. um, and couples for whom a third cycle would be clinically effective but are actually precluded from accessing the third cycle just now <coughs> because there's only two cycles available to them on the NHS um, and they may not be able to afford a third cycle themselves, even although it may be clinically appropriate and effective for them to have that. Um, so, I, in terms... <coughs> Sorry, I we can't, we can't give you an exact percentage. ISD will be able to give you that. But I think, generally speaking, it's not a massive number that progressed to the third cycle. We're not, we're not saying, you know, everybody must have it. That's what I was trying to point out earlier. The option should be there under the NHS, but not everybody will avail themselves of it, either for clinical reasons, uh, from, as explained by the clinician, or because they themselves say, no, we don't want to, to go yeah. any further. I, I, <clears throat> Sylvia, I, I totally agree with you. It's a situation I know very well. And I, at the end of the day, as I say, the situation is that, that, to my mind, a third cycle could be possible because it won't be a high percentage of people who want to go there. And uh, if the convener allows me again to come back to the point of um, the stress, the trauma uh, that, that the women go through, going through this, you know, with the greatest respect, uh, for a man it's not the same, uh, for, a, for a lady, it, uh, you know, it, it's a tremendous pressure, you know, just for a, a, a woman to walk down the street and see, you know, uh, children, you know, with their mothers, whatever, uh, that, that is a, a great mental stress, 
uh, on a on a woman, and and basically I think that a percentage, uh, you know, the the third cycle, as far as I'm concerned, whatever situation that people can get to in order to ensure that they can get the full benefit uh, and also go through um, in order to, to have a child, uh, I, I believe that the third cycle should be an offer because I don't believe it is a high percentage of people who uh, will need the third cycle, as you, as you quite rightly have suggested. Would you agree with that? Yes, we, although, as I say, we, I can't give you the percentage at the moment, but, yes, we, we think it's it's it's... That's another reason why we don't understand why they're not moving to the third cycle. Well, I, I, I wish you to, uh, uh, just to finish off, I wish you success. It's a subject which, uh, as I say, uh, I've had experience of, and at the end of the day, uh, I would support uh, your view. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to let a uh, couple of my colleagues in for supplementaries. Okay. Sorry, Susan, just, do you want to add on? I just yeah. wanted to add one thing there, um, and where couples know that actually thir three cycles is, gives them the optimum chance of success um, and they're then denied access to that. Going forward, it's very difficult for them to come to terms with the fact that they haven't given it their best shot and yeah. that can have massive emotional and psychological effects on them going forward. Not everybody will be successful with treatment, we know that. We, <coughs> we can't guarantee everybody can have a baby but what we should be doing is guaranteeing that they have the best possible chance and then if they're not successful, it's easier for them to come to terms with what has actually been a failure to conceive and move forward. It's much easier to do that if you've really given it the best chance that you have. OK, that's quite powerful. Thank you very much for, for putting that on the record. Um, I've got Graham Day followed by Colin Keir. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Convener. Uh, we've heard today that the intention was, it seems, always to look to move to three cycles <clears throat> once we had reduced and standardised the waiting times. <laughs> And you've told us that you believe the capacity is there to deliver on that, uh, albeit we, it's difficult to quantify the numbers that would be involved. In your view, is it simply finance that's behind the resistance, or the apparent resistance to move to three on the part of the boards? Um, I, I can't see any other reason for them not wanting to move. It's clinically effective. You know, every, When NICE made their recommendations in England, um, they looked at a huge range of studies and they recommended that um, looking at, I think they looked at four or five different studies, but they came out with the fact that three cycles gave the best balance of cost and clinical effectiveness. Um, the national group looked at that, they did their own research behind it, and everybody in the group was agreed that moving forward, three cycles was the best possible um, way to move forward for patients. Why anybody would not want to move forward with that um, I have no idea, unless it's finance related, um, unless the health boards don't want to give couples a third cycle because it's going to cost them. Um, I, I can't see any other reason why they wouldn't want to do it. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Colin Keir. Uh, thank you. <coughs> um, my question really is uh, surrounding those who self-fund. Uh, within the, the, the NHS and um, really was sorry if you've answered some of this previously um, just need to have it clear in my mind but um, it's really the idea of does this mean that people could be jumping queues in terms of uh, waiting times uh, for the services You mean if they were to self-fund? Mm. Um, well, if, if they were to self-fund, then that doesn't impact on the NHS waiting times. Um, self-funding or private treatment um, is something completely separate from the NHS. Within the time. NHS? Yes, they have, they have a different capacity. The, the um, NHS clinics who do offer self-funding treatment um, offer a small proportion of self-funding treatment um, and they have a waiting list for that as well which I think is balanced by their NHS waiting list um, so if a patient opts to self-fund they can do that in an NHS clinic um, it shouldn't have an impact on the NHS waiting times because the health board should all be contracting to do a certain number of NHS cycles in their unit um, self-funding I would hope would not have an impact on that. Uh, right. There's also the option of private treatment for for people, and many people opt to go to the private clinics. <coughs> okay, excuse me. Sorry, I apologise. Ropey throat. Okay, yeah, that, that's okay then. I think that more or less. 
I, I just I just wanted to say that um, this is a very sp highly specialised medical field, and there are a limited number of clinicians practising in Scotland. That's all I want to say. Okay. Um, I don't see any of my, my colleagues bidding for a question, but I was going to ask one myself, but I will go after Dennis Robertson. Dennis. Uh, one more, if I may convene. It's, um, it, it's on this basis that you, you believe that it's maybe the resource. It could be financial. Is it possible, you know, just taking up Sylvia's point there, because of the, the, the specialised nature of, of um, the fertility clinics, uh, and the specialism that there's a capacity issue as well as a, um, a financial one in terms of moving to the third cycle? We're, we're not aware of a capacity issue um, in the NHS centres at the moment. They're all um, apparently have, as far as we're aware, have the capacity to move to the third cycle. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't think that there's... Yeah. Um, any yeah. capacity okay. issue. Again, that's maybe yeah. something to clarify with the health boards themselves, okay. but we've been told that there there isn't a capacity um, and they have the capacity to move forward okay. with additional cycles. Again, it's language. It just it, it does concern me that we're using terms like aware and um, we're, we're not absolute in this area. This may be something we could follow up, convener. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think the, the work of the national group um, and the work of ISD um, around the figures um, is ongoing at the moment, and I think there will be much more um, clarity around about some of the figures that we just unfortunately don't have at the moment um, because it's an ongoing piece of work. Um, but in terms of capacity, the, as far as we know, the clinics have the capacity. Um, as, uh, in terms of the clinicians, um, the, the clinicians... As Sylvia said, it's a very specialised um, area, um, and the clinicians who work in the NHS centres also work in the private centres. Mm -hmm. um, but the, in terms of the actual capacity of the private centre, there shouldn't be, as far as we know, any issue. Mm -hmm. now, That's um, very useful. Now, earlier, I mentioned um, whether it was better to have a, a fresh embryo transfer or or from a frozen embryo and you were putting on record the evidence around that is starting to show that actually potentially that there could be a, a greater success uh, from from, from a, an embryo that has been has, has previously been frozen. So in terms of the emerging evidence and technology for what's best in relation to IVF and ICSI and the variety of methods that are out there, uh, have the NHS embraced all the technology they should do? I'm aware of, for example, um, EVA is is another technology where the, you, you can map the developing embryos mm -hmm. in the first three mm -hmm. to five days to work out which, which, which embryo has the has the highest chance. And it's not an exact science, of course. It's not has has the best chance to 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 make it when when transferred back 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 to mum. So I'm I'm sure if that's one technology that I'm aware of, I'm sure there's many out there which may be unproven but they exist. Is the are you aware of the NHS trying to embrace some of these technologies to increase yeah. the success rates? Yes, um, the, the technology you're talking about is actually called time-lapse imaging technology. Okay. Um, EVA is one particular um, trade name for one particular uh, method of time-lapse imaging. Okay. Um, another one is Embryoscope, and the Scottish NHS clinics all use Embryoscope. Again, that's thanks to the um, support of the government who funded them. Um, every NHS clinic has at least one or two um, embryoscopes, and I think Glasgow actually has four embryoscopes. Okay. And what that does is it gives them the best chance of picking, um, hopefully, the best embryo to, to use and the ones which are best um, likely to turn into a successful pregnancy, and also those which are suitable for freezing. So, okay. yes, I think they, they are embracing the technology. Mm. And I suppose here would be your opportunity to suggest other other emerging. I mean, this this may actually be developing into a bit of set of research and development theme of questioning mm -hmm. as much as anything, I suppose. But are there other emerging? This is your opportunity to maybe mention some other emerging technologies which you would like the NHS to at least, if not embrace, explore. I think the the next study for me is this study around about frozen embryo transfers. Okay where um, there is a school of thought that a frozen embryo transfer is now as good, if not perhaps better, than a fresh transfer. Um, and there is a large study, a large trial starting um, this year, 
which um, we're working with the researchers from Aberdeen um, and other units um, across the whole of the UK with. Um, they're going to be recruiting patients for a study to, to actually ascertain whether frozen embryo transfers for everyone might actually be a better way forward. And the reason it might be is if you don't have a fresh embryo transfer, you're less likely to have ovarian hyperstimulation. If you if you stimu stimulate the ovaries um, to produce lots of eggs, if you then replace an embryo whilst the body is in that state, okay. you, there is a risk of ovarian hyperstimulation. If you wait and always have a frozen embryo transfer, there's um, a thought that it may be better um, for mum, providing that the success rates are not compromised, and that's what that will be um, looking forward. So I think that's probably the next most interesting thing for us. Okay, thank you very much. Well, well, unless it's specifically on that, because Rhoda's been quite patient oh, to get in, is it specifically? Dennis, my apologies, I should, have, I should have let you know. Rhoda, followed by Dennis, yeah. Mine, mine was a supplementary to the previous questions about um, self-funding. Um, I'm wondering why people would self-fund other than for the third cycle if you don't get seen any faster, if it's available on the NHS for two cycles. Why would somebody self-fund to the NHS? Some people will opt for private treatment, first of all, and that's going to a private um, clinic. Um, and they'll do that because they don't want to wait at all um, or because they don't fit the eligibility criteria. Um, patients who self-fund in the NHS centres, again, in a lot of cases, tend to be those who don't fit the eligibility criteria. If you um, don't fit the tight eligibility criteria you have no option but to pay for your treatment so there will always be room for <coughs> private or self-funded treatment um, because not everybody will qualify for NHS treatment So if you go to a private clinic you get seen straight away, if you self-fund in the NHS you join the waiting list with everybody else? Um, you do but it's a much shorter waiting list than the general NHS waiting list would be um, although there's not such a vast difference now that the waiting times have come down. If you go back a couple of years to when there was a four-year waiting list for some um, patients to access treatment, um, you could probably be seen in a few months uh, an NHS self -funded, um, as an NHS self-funded patient. Now that waiting lists are down under 12 months, um, I suspect less people will opt to self-fund or pay for private treatment if they fit the eligibility criteria. But many patients don't fit that criteria. So they would always have to pay for the treatment in one way or another. OK, so you would be seen sooner on the NHS as a self-funder than as an NHS-funded patient? Yes, I think, I think the difference is you're not really being seen on the NHS, you're being seen in an NHS unit, um, but you're paying for your treatment in the unit. For instance, if you go to Glasgow um, and you opt to self-fund, the money that you spend as an NHS self-funded patient or a self-funded patient in an NHS unit goes back into the research um, side of the university. Um, so that gets invested back in there. But you're, you're not really an NHS patient. You're just being seen and treated at an NHS centre. It's almost like being a private patient at an NHS hospital. Could that be a disincentive for the third cycle, given that people are paying for the third cycle and that pays for research? Um, it could be. Um, equally, I, I guess it could be a disincentive for um, clinicians if they are looking for people to pay for their private treatment um, in, the, in the private sector as well as, as NHS self-funding. It may be. Really interestingly, a question from, from Rhoda Grant. The one thing I might add to that um, might be, uh, Sylvia Shearer mentioned there only are so many specialists in this field. And I'm just wondering if there swings and roundabouts to this whole process and by having self-funded individuals using facilities within an NHS establishment is one way of retaining highly specialist staff that you may otherwise lose to the to the private sector. Has any mapping been done in kind of, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the most senior echelons of, of this expertise within the NHS or in Scotland more generally? Or is it actually you have to headhunt from globally in relation to these these things? I think most of the most of the clinicians um, in Scotland um, work both in the NHS but also in the private sector. Not necessarily just as as NHS, not necessarily as self funding within the NHS, but they also work in the private centres um, as well. So I think every 
every NHS clinician also has private practice. Sorry, is that is that what you were asking? Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm just trying to work out whether you get full time specialists in the NHS, and is that a way of retaining them within an NHS facility or not? If it's not fine, I've misunderstood what the dynamic is. There, I'm just trying to understand it for myself. Well, it's 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 difficult to say, really, isn't it? Because we don't, we haven't got statistics that we could yeah. that we could provide on that. But it, it might be something that you want to ask the clinicians yeah. themselves. If, if you're speaking, or the boards themselves. Yeah, and we'll take that opportunity. It's obviously not, you don't need to have that information. I'm no. just curious to know if you, if you had a, a view on it. Now, with a couple of additionals, so I think uh, Richard Lyle, who was technically in ahead of you, Dennis, my apologies, I didn't see you, Richard, and then Dennis Robertson. Um, the, the problem we have is we don't have up-to-date, really up-to-date information. I'm, I'm reading from a, a, a paper that <coughs> National Unfair Infertility Group report shows that 2011-12 there were 1,368 cycles provided by the NHS and 703 of those were self-funded but provided in an NHS centre. Um, so that was only 2,071 cycles provided in that year. Again, we don't have up-to-date. But can I come on to um, two of the questions I want to ask? Do you believe the NHS boards view infertility treatment as a low priority compared to treatment of other conditions? I think some of them probably do view it as a lower priority than, than some conditions, yes, I suspect so. Yeah, OK. Um, I think that's wrong. But no, I no, 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 no. I just uh, think we also come into the, the factor of Nowadays, people get married, um, got to pay a mortgage, got to, you know, both, both couples are working, uh, ladies are having babies later in life. So wider social factors such as the tendency of couples to delay starting a family has meant that demand for treatment has grown. Do you, um, would you agree with that? While the incidence of infertility has remained the same, would you agree with that statement? Um, I think the very fact that people are leaving it longer to start trying actually means that there is a higher incidence of um, fertility problems in the first place. Yeah. Um, but there's no doubt that um, the older you are, particularly for the woman, the harder it is to conceive. Um, you're more likely to have issues, but you're also more likely to have male factor issues as well. Um, yeah. The longer you leave it, the, the more chance there is of um, males having issues um, with their sperm, either with motility or with the count. And that can be a lot to do with lifestyle factors as well. And, that's another thing that we're trying to work very hard on is to try to, to raise awareness um, and education around about um, fertility issues and how, in some cases, some lifestyle choices that you make when you're younger can actually make a difference to you going forward when you do decide to try to have a family. Well, as uh, an as a admitted smoker, um, you know, if you're, if you're smoking, uh, that, that can Stop reduce... Yeah. Um, and also, uh, I, but I don't do this as often... Uh, uh, drinking, um, you know, that could also reduce your, your time. But again, can we come back to the, the, the cost of um, cycle? Um, I, I'm, I'm getting a, a feeling that uh, are in the papers that I've got in front of me, it's roughly an average of £3,600 per cycle. Now, is that every cycle or, or, or also the fact that as they go older that the cost gets higher? Um, but would you agree that uh, you know an average cycle is three thousand, well under four thousand pounds? That's the figures that we've been given by the health boards. An average cycle is round about three thousand six hundred pounds, um, and that would be for anybody going through treatment. Um, it, it varies slightly depending on the number of drugs and which drugs you need. <coughs> yeah. um, but the overall average cost um, is a, is around about that figure. Right. So just to finish off, can you know, to get it in my mind? Average cost cycle three thousand under four thousand yeah. pounds. Um, not all couples uh, will go for three cycles. Uh, <coughs> a very low percentage, actually, the feeling I'm getting, uh, would, would actually physically need three cycles. Would you agree with that statement? I would agree with that. I think a lot of couples would um, not... They, they, they would either be pregnant on the first or the second cycle. Um, some of them will go on to have a third cycle and be successful. Some of them will decide not to have a third cycle and some clinicians will actually recommend that it's not in their best interests. So, yes, I would agree it's a low number of patients who would actually move forward and need this third cycle. Um, 
but massively important for them to get it if they and, and lastly, convenient, it's just the fact that, you know, as you said earlier, that a lady uh, or, or who is going through this, uh, the more they have to go back, the more that may affect their, 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 their mental health. Uh, so no one would actually want to go and do three cycles if they didn't need to. Nobody would want to go through fertility treatment in the first place if they didn't have to. It's not the way anybody would choose to conceive their baby. Absolutely not. It's the, if it's the only way to do it, then that's the way that they will do it because it's massively important to them. But it's not, it's not a lifestyle choice. It's not something that you would ever, ever do if you didn't want to. Thank you very much. You have to. We're last 10 minutes. Uh, Dennis Robertson. I'll, I'll try and be uh, brief, convener. Um, is there an option for couples to look at the possibility of a multiple uh, birth in the first instance? So, for instance, a transfer of maybe two or three uh, embryos uh, in the first instance. I mean, do couples have that option? Or is it, or is it from a clinical perspective, just the, the one you get more success? There... Um the HFEA, which is the regulatory body um, for f all fertility treatment in the UK, has set all clinics a multiple birth target, um, which is 10%. So all clinics should be trying to get to at least, if not below 10% of multiple births um, in their IVF treatment. Um, the best possible outcome from fertility treatment is a single healthy baby. And I think everybody is pretty much on the same page and everybody agrees that the more embryos you transfer, the higher the risk of having twins or triplets. And whilst twins sounds like a good idea if you're trying to have a family, it's an instant family, there's higher risks to the mum um, of mm. a trip of pregnancy complications, but there's also massive risks to the babies of being born prematurely, um, needing special care, which is an additional cost to the NHS, um, but then also needing support right throughout their lives. Um, Sometimes just through their early schooling, but um, if they have real health issues, then it, you know, it can follow them um, right through many, many years of their lives. So everybody's pretty much agreed that the best outcome is to have a single healthy baby. So for most couples, a single embryo transfer would be the best way forward. Mm. Um, it's not a one size fits all. Some mm. people may have a double embryo transfer. Um, very, very, very few um, now have a double embryo transfer, especially on the first cycle. Okay, but it is possible by choice as well? Um, only if the clinician um, and the patient have discussed it yeah. and the clinician feels that actually putting one embryo back would compromise the chance of success. Um, if they feel that a single embryo would be successful, um, then no, the clinician would be very, very um, reticent to put more than one back. Okay, that's uh, very interesting, and uh, being a father of twins, it's uh, exciting but challenging. Yes, and I think <laughs> when twins when twins turn out well, it's great, but sadly that's not always the reality. Okay, thank you, Dennis Richard Simpson. Yeah, just two quick questions. One is, are you satisfied with the current monitoring arrangements of the success rates, and are these published? The success rates are published um, by the HFEA on the HFEA yes. website. Um, yes. They, at the moment, are looking. They've done a big exercise on how they might improve the publication of their information, including the success rates. Um, and they will be announcing later this year um, changes to the way they actually publish their success rates um, on their website. Yes, I, I, I wanted that on the record. I was aware of the fact that there was going to be a change. My other question is, are you satisfied with the current eligibility criteria? I was stimulated to ask that point by the fact that self-funders, you said, often do not meet the eligibility criteria. One of the cases, or two of the cases I've had in the last uh, 13 years have been where one of the partners already has a child. Um, and it, it does concern me if there's a new relationship that the, you know, either the man or the woman who has not had any children is barred under the current system from having a child under IVF. And that does seem to me to be, you know, discriminatory against the individual who has not actually had uh, a child themselves. And so I just wonder if you've got a comment on that specific item, yes. but also whether you're satisfied with the remaining threshold of eligibility mm -hmm. criteria and the difference between self-funders and, and NHS. 
taking the eligibility criteria first, at the moment, um, couples are not able to access treatment if they have a child living in the home. Um, and that very, very much discriminates against couples who are in a second relationship um, where one has kept custody of the child and is therefore not eligible for treatment, but the other partner who's moved on to a different relationship would be eligible for treatment. Um, and that's very inequitable. And that was one of the criteria which, along with the number of cycles, is up for um, review at the moment. The recommendation from the group was to move towards a, a criteria where couples could access IVF treatment on the NHS where one partner had no genetic child. And they felt that that would be a fairer way um, of addressing that particular inequity. So that should be um, under discussion with the national group at the moment. Um, and we would hope that they would make um, a recommendation to change that particular criteria. I would certainly welcome it. I regard it as being completely inequitable. And, uh, you know, I know that when there was massive inequity with the postcode lottery, etc., that had to be solved first. But yes. I think there are, mm -hmm. there are individuals who are being badly discriminated against there and, are, in fact, punished for taking custody, yes. which is the really frightening thing about it that, uh, uh, to me that uh, you, you, you take custody of the child on a breakup that precludes you from having IVF. It, it's very wrong, um, and we actually know of couples um, who've come to us um, very upset about this, um, and it's been suggested to mm. them along the way by somebody that actually if they gave up custody of the child, they would then be able to access treatment, yeah. um, which is clearly not something they're going to do, but yes, it's very inequitable, and that's something that we would very much hope would uh, be addressed. If, if it doesn't get sorted, can I suggest that you raise a European human rights challenge because I really think this is this is a matter of human rights that is not being addressed appropriately at the present time. Thank you. Okay, Richard. Yes. Okay, um, Graham. You're finished. Um, are there any other questions from? Okay. Um, can I um, thank you very much for taking the time to to get evidence today? I think it's worth saying on behalf of myself and our colleagues, given given the fact. There's been some topicality in the news in relation to uh, uh, children that have been born uh, via fertility treatment. I'd like to reassure you this was a long-standing piece of work that this committee was determined to do in relation to shine a light and the, the opportunities and benefits that come and the happiness and joy that comes from families who have children via infertility treatment. And we are completely supportive of it. And... Uh, um, disassociate ourselves from any negative comments in relation to, 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 to that. I think that's a reasonable thing to say, but also that you've given us a lot of information uh, for which to shine a light on how NHS boards are dealing with these matters next week when we, we take evidence. And uh, just before we leave it there, we've got a couple of minutes. If there's any final comments you'd like to put on the record uh, before we move into private session. I think we'd just like to say, um, first of all, thank you for giving us the opportunity to come and give evidence um, here. This is a really important topic um, for us, obviously, but it's so important for patients that um, they do get the best possible chance um, to address their fertility problems and to move forward. Um, and we really welcome and thank you for your support. Um, I hope that moving forward um, very, very soon, that both the number of cycles um, and the question of um, children in the home, existing children, um, are both addressed by the national group. Um, and we appreciate your support in, in looking at all these issues. OK, thank you. I, I echo all of that. Um, if I could just bring you back for one moment to the, the education project that's been funded by the Scottish Government, which we're undertaking. We're trying very much along the lines of preventative education here, uh, going into uh, Freshers' Week, etc. And I think that that's something that we, as a, an organisation, would, would like to encourage and in, enforce more, because if we can advise people not to leave it as late as they are doing for the social reasons that you've already explained, that the danger is that they, that they will then have to go through. and uh, so, so if we can get that balance right, it should mean that there's a, a, a relatively static need for IVF treatment as opposed to an ever-increasing need. If, if we can tackle it mm -hmm. at both ends, basically, is what I'm saying. Thank you for putting that on the record. Absolutely informed choice 
for people who wish to have families is, is vitally important in the work you're doing. I, I commend you on that. So thank you once more for your time this morning. And that does conclude the public part of our meetings. So as previously agreed, we're now going to move into private session. Thank you. Thank you.